Hello and welcome to my podcast. Do me a favor, subscribe to the John Con Report wherever you get your podcast. You're watching on YouTube, hit that like button, hit that subscribe button. You can find us there as part of Empire Media. That's A M P I R E. Always much appreciated when you tune in. Don't forget, you can always read my work on ESPN.com. I'll have a story up in the next couple of days based on what Dan Quinn looks for in a quarterback based in part on his defensive background. He had some couple of interesting things to say. Asked him very briefly about Drake May, Jaden Daniels. So we had a little bit of nuggets in there for that. Anyway, that should be up on ESPN.com any day now. So look for that sometime in the next couple of days. Also, by the time you hear this, I will have already had my private Zoom session for the gold members. If you want to become a club member and participate in some of these, you can go to the Empire Media YouTube page, see the word join, click on that, find your club level membership you're comfortable with and go from there. Always appreciate anybody who does that. And, and if you don't, that's great too, because I'm still going to be doing a lot of these folks. And I think you know that by now. Anyway, today I'm joined by Sam Fortier from the Washington Post. As we discuss a few things, one, the commander's return for offseason workouts. We were able to talk to a handful of the players today about, and it's all returning guys, Tress Way, Deron Payne, Terry McLaurin, Sam Cosby. Just get their thoughts on being back in the building, especially for some of them. They've been here now a few years. So they, well, actually all of them have been here for a few years. So they know the difference. And some of them have been through a couple regime changes. Is this different? So Sam and I discuss all that. And then we talk about his visits to the Drake May and Jaden Daniels pro days on back-to-back -back days. We talk about the quarterbacks in general, but a lot of other things surrounding the roster. One thing he asked me is, is this roster better able to support a rookie quarterback and even comparing it to the RG3 year when, when with the roster that was around him and what can make it work. Anyway, we get into all that. It's a good one. Sam and I, I always have fun with Sam on there. And even get into a little bit of 1970s TV show nostalgia that you may or may not have heard. So anyway, stay tuned for that. Here's my conversation with Sam Fortier from the Washington Post. All right, Sam, before we get started, I have to give a belated shout out. Happy birthday to Mama Fortier. So I think you said she's, what, 45 now? So happy birthday to her. I'm like that. That's funny, man, because my birthday is the 22nd. Hers is the 24th. So I'm glad you made sure to give her the shout out. I think I put you on. I think I gave you a shout out on Twitter or X or whatever it is. So I'm not that's sure. Fair. My, that's fair. I'm not chewing my cabbage twice here now. <laughs> I've never heard that. Is that, a, is that an expression? That, that, that was an actual expression from like, all right, anybody who's a little bit older, if they remember the show Hee Haw, that's what that was from. And I was a kid watching it. So yes, that's that's a very old reference. So, hee haw. Hee haw. Do a Google on hee haw. What, so, what is that? It's just just do a Google on hee haw. I, I'm gonna bet that your mom probably knows that. So um she can fill you on later. But if you do a Google on he it was this listen, man, it's when you had four choices on TV and it was like a I can't remember what night it was on. And it was like, it was, it was goofy and it was like country music stuff. And I, at that time I didn't like, that was not for me, but you, but you knew what hee-haw was. And I think that was an expression pulled from hee-haw. And I've only, I use it like once every five years. You've never heard of that expression or that TV show? Well, you shouldn't have heard of it. Of right. either one. But, but. I'm not going to chew my cabbage twice. Like I, you got to work that into, you got to work that into a column at some point. That's, that's good. It's funny. It's, it's a good line. It's like, you don't bring it out too often because you don't want to spoil it. And so you just have to bring it out when at, at the right time without overdoing it. So, but yeah, Google hee haw. <laughs> so, you know, the, the older people listening to this are like, Oh yeah. The younger people are like, what the hell is going on? So what is Sam going in, getting into here? So anyways, let's get to quarterbacks and commanders and all that. So today we were on the Zoom with guys coming back for the, for the off-season workouts. And I'm curious, like we talked to Trust Way, who is always upbeat about everything. So um, but we talked to him, Deron Payne, Terry McLaurin, and Sam Cosby. I'm just curious if there was, you know, what you picked up on from them in general your takeaways after our zoom sessions. I think our, 
my my number one takeaway is just that guys feel like it's a new vibe, right? And that sounds probably a little squishy, and it's their second day back for for off season program. But the thing that stood out to me is that Sam Cosby said it's it's different in the sense that they're mixing offense and defense. The locker room is scrambled. Last year when you walked in the locker room, it was, you know, receivers right to your left, um, you know, practice squad right to your right, you know, you know, right ahead of you was the O-line. So if they're mixing things up and making guys, you know, hey, like make sure you get to know your teammates, I, I get the approach there. One of the things that I'm curious about, and I asked Tress Way this, is – Trust Way has been through, what, three, four regimes now, three, four coaching staff since he's been in Washington. And everybody comes in and there's always optimism early. You know, with with the Ron, like, I was having some some flashbacks when people were talking about the new vibe and taking the, you know, they didn't say that they took the doors off or whatever, but that was the thing with Ron. Like, they took the ping pong table out. They put bean bags in or whatever. Like, does this stuff matter? Like, is it, like, can you tell in the first few days, like, that these people are are going to take you where you want to go. They're going to, you know, re-energize and, and get this franchise right. And because because to me right now, it's just like it's it's fluff. Um, right. it, it's it's good vibes. I'm glad they're having fun going to work. But like, does this mean anything? And press was kind of like, yeah, kind of like it does mean something because it's important, especially what that locker room felt like at the end of last year. Right. I think they needed to come to work and, and have levity and change things up. But to me, like, this is all nice, but do they pick the right quarterback? That's, that's still I, the biggest thing. I was just going to say, the vibe will be dependent upon who they pick at number two and if that guy works out. That always, a good quarterback helps the vibe of, of any locker room. I will say, you know, if you bring in the right leaders, if you mix up the locker room like that, it can have a nice impact. Like, you can, there were times where I thought the locker room was great, but they were only like nine and seven because – that's that's what the talent they had, right? But the locker room itself was really good because you had certain leaders that I felt like mingled, you know, were able to transcend offense or defense. So if that helps, but you're right, it still comes down to the quarterback. And there is, I've covered a few of these things you may have heard. Um, so there is always, I always laugh, like it used to be, because they would change defensive coordinators all the time way back in the day. And everyone would come in and say, we're going to be really aggressive. And I remember like, at some point, this has to be, we're going to be more aggressive than last year. At some point, this had to be the most aggressive defense ever based on being more aggressive than the previous regime. But I do, you know, I, I, I agree with you. I think some of this is just absolutely stems from last year was brutal. And I think anytime you, you do that, there's going to be that freshness to it. Um, I also think that Dan Quinn brings a certain level of energy. So that helps, but you're right. Like, you know, what, we'll see where this goes. Um, but I think, you know, we'll see. And I would like to point out that it was not just the players who were eager for this off season program to start, but also some reporters, because in our group <laughs> text today, in our group text today, time at the, at the, a lot of time he said, Hey, can you let me into the zoom? It's, it's, uh, you haven't let me in yet. It's, it's time. And uh, a public relations staffer who will remain nameless, <laughs> said off-season eagerness a tale as old as time or as old as time well so here's the funny thing and that was a funny line and but what 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 what, what a tweet me on that is standing yes. tweeting an oh snap meme or gif and i'm like then you're probably older than me and if you're not you look older than me so stop <laughs> oh man but, but you know here's in my defense like they said that Tress was coming up. I'm like, oh no, is he going right now? And then I realized they said the Zoom was opening at 11. So I was like the little kid in line for for Santa, I guess. <laughs> yes, but hopefully that was hopefully that was okay that I shared that on the show and you're not gonna, I, not going to be upset. No, no. Okay. We, I can edit this out. Don't worry. <laughs> no, I'll leave it in. Um, but well, the other thing that it's funny because like I remember talking to Cosme at the end of the season where he felt he even said like, it's going to feel like an expansion team when he comes back. And he's the one who said, this is like a new team. And it's not just the coaches too, though. And I think one of the things that Tress talked about too was, is he said he saw Bobby Wagner. He's like, it's freaking Bobby Wagner, like the impact of some of those additions. But again, how, what do they have left to as a player? That's what's going to help the most. But how much of that do you think added to that freshness and the new vibe? Absolutely. And I would say like, you know, 
Because this was the concept of Thomas Davis, right? In 2020, oh, we're going to bring in this great linebacker that we've had forever. What does he have left? And I think Bobby arrives at least with a recent track record, a little bit better than Thomas Davis. And, and I think that, you know, his position, is, he should have a more direct impact on this defense. Um, but I, I really think not to, not to say something super obvious, but I think the real new vibe is ownership, you know, like this is the right. first regime of the new ownership and like, you don't have Dan Snyder anymore. So you, you have optimism that things can really be different um, that you're not going to reach at, you know, for this quarterback at number two that you probably shouldn't or, you know, because he played with so-and-so, but like, I think that they're putting a lot of things in place, whether it be sports science, sports nutrition. Like, I think that there's just a lot of different things. And even, you know, down the line, the team facility, a new stadium, like there is a logical path forward where it feels like, Hey, like this franchise is, is on the right course and the coaching staff and, and the roster is, is obviously a big part of that. Well, think about it too. This is the first time like last year we had the sale talk going on. There was uncertainty with them, you know, and, and then even after the ownership change, there's uncertainty about the coaching staff and their futures. A lot of talk about that. Previous two years, investigation, investigation, you had pandemic. This is probably the first normal year for this, for the people who have been here for a while, Tim McLaurin, Trust Way, that this might be the first normal year they've had in a while. I mean, I, I would think that's part of it too. Yeah, and I think that like the focus remaining on football, I think cannot be understated. Like the things that we are not talking about are probably the most relevant things to their progress as a football team. Like the discussion, you know, is not sale. It's who are they hiring as coordinators? Who are they bringing in in free agency? And for them to not make a huge splash, you know, for a guy who's over the hill and they pay him a ton of money. Like it's just, there are a lot of examples of the negative space is actually where you're seeing the most progress. Right. And you know, the other thing that jumped out to me too, because Terry was at Terry McLaurin was asked about, he's a guy that likes to work on something different in his game every off season. And, you know, he was asked that again today. And sometimes guys have kind of platitudes about that and like, Oh, I'm working on everything, working on this. He gives very direct answers about what he's working on. And he's talking about like the, the top, you know, getting better at the top of his route, which he's talked about before, but he gives a direct reasoning because of the way defenses are now playing and all that. So I always find it fascinating to talk to him to hear what he's working on. Um, what, what did you think about that? The thing that stuck out to me is, you know, he said that he hasn't watched any tape on the quarterbacks. He's not going to give any input for this draft, but he's going to have to build rapport with another right. new quarterback. And so he's obviously an expert at that at this point. Um, but him saying those different things, you know, defense are playing more too high shells. So, you know, you get, you're getting a little bit more zone coverage and, and I want to get better at the top of my routes and, um, you know, those digs and certain things because those are better against, you know, zone coverage. And so I think that he, um, his insight into that process and, and how he can be the best receiver that he can be for a quarterback, I think is one of the reasons why, you know, you're seeing a lot of teams that have found a quarterback move on from their receivers, right? Like we saw it with Tyreek Hill and the chiefs. We saw it today um, with the bills and Stefan Diggs. And I know Stefan is, is a little bit older now, but I think that really Terry, to me, that quote kind of underscored the value. If you don't have a franchise quarterback that can elevate everyone else, the, the, having a receiver that keeps that in mind for his young quarterback, how can I be the best guy I can be? I think that's why they brought in Zach Ertz. That dude knows how to get open and he's going to be a good security blanket for a young quarterback. And I think those are the types of mindsets you need from your pass catchers if you're going to go get somebody. Right. And I think the other thing too is being friendly to the quarterback. And I think Terry, I've heard, you know, he's talked about that in the past and the ways you do that, the way, you know, knowing where to sit down in his zone, knowing how to get open here and knowing that, this quarterback's going to be facing this. I can break this off here. I think Zach Ertz is like, can be like that. And I think Terry can be like that. That's another thing that he's always talked about wanting to be friendly for the quarterback. Um, but he also talks about wanting to build up a rapport. And that's one thing. I mean, that poor guy is like, this is his going into his sixth year. And this will be another new starting quarterback, at least with this one, whomever they draft, you would think that you're going to be able to build something over the next couple of years um, just to get that rhythm. Because like, even with Sam, he talked about it that, you know, he, he was, I mean, he, he liked Sam. And there were things that they did well, but he also knew there were things that were building. And I remember talking about this during the season. And there's just some plays where it's like, you want to get that rapport where you can look at a guy kind of give a little hand signal and, and okay, here comes the back shoulder. Here comes this. That's something you takes time to build. 
I also think this is an interesting entry point to a discussion about where do we feel like the supporting cast is at for a young quarterback? Because when I think about guys that came into good situations, I think like the 2011 Panthers were really good. They had both those good running backs. They had a solid line. They had Olsen. They had Steve Smith. I think about the Texans last year was pretty good. Washington, when when RG3 got here, I thought was in a really good position. Um, and, and I wonder where you're at on have they done an obviously you know you're probably going to look at an offensive lineman or two for the rest of the offseason particularly one at the top of the draft uh after two but i wonder like where you think this supporting cast compares to the one that rg3 was dropped into well i think one of the things that that i look at with this group is the you know just the talk about the run game being being having heavier emphasis on the run game i think that's going to help so i think to me, the what the benefit here is is the um, the the philosophy more so than just the talent directly around them because that group was pretty good. But like you know, when Robert came here, he was coming to a team that had lost double digit games two years in a row, and when when the, in 2011, their top receivers were Jabbar Gaffney and Dante Stallworth were two of their top three receivers. They were out of the league at the next year. So you had Santana Moss, you had Garcon, who was added, was very good. Um, you know, uh, you Cooley, you know, so they were, they were good, but I felt like what it was, was the scheme around him. They really accentuated that group. So I think that's, uh, to me, it started with that. Defensively, they weren't very good, but what they did do is take the ball away. And that's where I go to this group. I don't know how good they're going to be. I think this is a better, this is a better staff than what we just witnessed. And so I think that's going to help. And I think the way they use them could help. So I think those are the little things around the quarterback that can help them. Now, in terms of like, you know, they don't have Trent Williams at left tackle. We don't know. We don't know who it is. Right. Um, but that's what they don't have. So you don't have that linchpin to build around an offensive line, but you have a strong interior Cosme, Biotish, and then Allegretti, I think, to then give them a strong run game inside. So that's where it's going to help them. Um, and and then like you look at 2012, Alfred was a perfect, perfect, perfect fit for what they wanted to do. That dude knew how to set up blocks in that zone read run game. Do they have a guy that can run like that? And I don't, you know, I think Brian Robinson is a good between the tackles runner. I thought Alfred was a very smart runner. And I, I don't know if Brian is at that point. I think there are things he does better, catches the ball better. So I think that's, that's an interesting topic too. But I think it was the way they were coached accentuated them. And I think that's what they're going to, you know, but, and I will say this too, like, I don't know how this coaching staff is going to be offensively. Like there's still stuff. We know all individuals. We don't know how it's going to look together. I mean, I still curious to see it. I knew with that offensive staff, I really thought even at that time that Kyle Shannon, it was a very, very good offensive coordinator. So, um, but I do think the philosophy and the defense can offset some of the growing pains for for a quarterback, a young quarterback. I think that's a really important point because, you know, you think about that staff. I don't know if you heard, but Washington had a pretty good coaching staff back then. Uh, Anybody they, going to be a head coach? Yeah. <laughs> um, but but what do Cliff Kingsbury and Brian Johnson and, and Tavita and, and all these guys, how do they mesh what they do? I think – because you see, you assemble an all-star staff, everyone hasn't worked together before, and, and it could end up like the Frank Reich Panthers. Like, you know, I'm not saying that will happen, but I guess that's always the risk of of some of these things. And so there is a lot of talent there, um, but you don't know. And I would say on the on the defensive side, it's interesting because I um, don't remember that, that defense as well that was complimenting Robert. But I think that the defense here, even though I know it was bad last season, I don't think it was as bad as we saw because of the imbalance in the pass run split. And I think that if you do bring more balance, if you try to play a more complimentary game game flow, then I, I think, and especially with the guys they brought in, and, and I think that you have to feel good about, you know, Dan Quinn being able to use those guys in the right way. I would say that the pieces will probably add up to – more than the sum of their parts than, than they did last year, certainly. And I think that like the defense will be in a better position to support that quarterback. Agreed. And I think the, you know, limiting turnovers too, which is part of that run game philosophy too. And then it depends on the quarterback. Cause there's all, again, they're going to grow growing pains regardless of who they get, but if you can limit it and then um, both, whether it's May or Daniels or JJ or whatever, but those other two can run, right. They can get out of some trouble. So um, anyway, but I think that that is, I think, and we, when we were at the league meetings, 
Dan Quinn would talk about strong run game and defense because that's how you're going to help it. And you're not going to run, you know, they're not going to throw the ball 65% of the time. And it wasn't just because they were falling behind in games. It was like that in the first half of games. It was, it was ridiculous. And, and I think the offense hurt, paid a price for it, but the team paid a price, but it wasn't just that. But I do think like that's all going to help. You were at the pro days for, for Jaden and Drake. I'm curious, like what your takeaways were from, from being at those. So a lot of takeaways from, from being in Baton Rouge and, and Chapel Hill. And I would say the first one probably is um, that at the, at the beginning of the day, they, they weighed in and, and Jane Daniels who had opted out of all the, the testing and the measurements, the combine, you know, we finally got a, um, a, a real measurement on him. And I would say, that he said he didn't do any of the combine stuff because he wanted to get more exposure for his teammates. And, you know, I, I think that's a really admirable sentiment. Some scouts who were skeptical said he wanted more time to put on as much weight as he could. Um, <laughs> because he is a, he is a thin frame guy. And I don't think that's going to change um, regardless. You know, when you get him in the building, he's going to be 24 years old in December. I, I don't know how much more that, that you can do with that frame that, that doesn't impact his, his rushing ability. But anyway, he, he measured and he was, I believe, 6'3 and 5'8 mm -hmm. and 210 pounds. Mm -hmm. There is not a lot of quarterbacks with a frame like that who have been drafted in the first round over the last two decades. There are, are three guys who are who are really within that range, and it's Teddy Bridgewater, Alex Smith, and Robert Griffin III. And somebody, you know, I was having a discussion with somebody who was like, hey, I, I think, you know, there's there's a couple other guys who are who are in that range, and, and they're like, you know, 6'4", 215. Um, but I think the thing is, you know, like um, – Joe Burrow was 6'4", 215. But I think the difference is that 210 is probably maxed out with 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 what Jaden Daniels was because we know that that was something he was he was thinking about during the pre-draft process. Whereas I think Joe Burrow, it's probably that's a more natural weight for him. Um, and so to me, I think the frame thing it doesn't mean he's going to be bad. It doesn't mean it doesn't doom him. But when you look at his running style, I think when you think 210, and especially if he plays closer to 205 or 200, you really got to start saying, okay, there's not a lot of precedent for a frame like this. It's not Bryce Young level. Like Bryce Young, I think was, was totally different last year, right. especially because of the height. But when you think about the size and the player that he is, just seeing him in person, I was like, okay, he is a thin frame guy. And I don't think he's going to miraculously, you know, look like Kyler Murray in, in terms of being bulked up. Right. And I think, you know, it's funny because it's the play style to match the frame because the frame itself, Kirk Cousins is not a is not a big guy. He's like six, three. And he played, I think, at two or five last year. And his injury did not come from the weight. But, you know, and he lost some weight a few years ago, but he doesn't play the same way. And I think that's why there's a little bit of if you're going to play this way, what's what are you going to do? can you survive at that weight in there? And, and how quickly do you learn to play at that weight in the NFL? Because, you know, you, you watch him, man. And there's sometimes with his runs, like, I mean, he leapfrog, he tries to leapfrog the line against Florida state. Doesn't quite work. Some bad hits. And then you see him make guys miss because he has a little bit of an ability to swerve and make guys miss and which is good, but you're going to learn in the NFL that it's going to be hard to do that. If he can do that, then I think that alleviates the fears about the weight. But they've got it. That's a mindset, too. I had one scout tell me, like, he thought this whole thing was overrated about the the weigh in because he was like, he's going to put on as much weight as he can. And then it's, you know, but but really, like, what you see is, is what you get, especially with his level of experience in college. Like, you are, as a GM, you are going to have to say, do I think his playmaking ability is sustainable over time, given his style of play? Or can, and, I, and I asked Brian Kelly, the LSU coach after the pro day, I said, you know, what is the question that teams have been asking you and what's been your message to them? And immediately he was like, they all ask, will he slide? <laughs> and he said, what I say to them is look, this is a tough competitive dude who got hit in the Alabama game, who, who had went to the concussion protocol, came out the next week and beat Florida. And he was like the first player in FBS history to have, I think 350 passing and 200 rushing in the same game. And he was like, you know, that that was his response. It wasn't, yes, he will slide. Yes, I believe he can do it. It was, this dude is a competitive dude who can overcome it. And so take that however you will. But I thought Brian Kelly's initial gut reaction, combined with the discussion that we're having about his size, was pretty informative. It is. And it was funny because you can go back to his Arizona State days. And um, when I had Herm Edwards on, I was asking him about this because he has a two-point conversion. I think it may have been against Oregon. 
but he turns the corner and there are literally like six guys there. And they get, he's, he's screwed. And he turns it up, he lowers his shoulder and he gets in. And like, that's that, that's that competitive mindset. Now, you know, <laughs> again, like we'll see what happens if you do this in the NFL too much, do you learn? And I, I will say the one thing, the one thing that I like, not the one thing, but one thing I like about his game is even though he runs a lot and we'll get into your little statistic in a minute, but even though, he, even though he runs a lot, even though he runs a lot, I feel like he goes through progressions too. So I think he can, I think he's, I think he has shown he can pass from the pocket more so than some other guys who I think who, who are runners and, you know, Robert, I don't think threw from the pocket like this, Lamar Jackson did not throw from the pocket like this. You know, so I think there's some guys that you, you know, that would run, but like Lamar is a bigger dude and he's, you know, he's, and he's a rare runner. So it's a little bit different, but, but I do like, that's one of the things I like about his ability. It's not a one re I covered Heath Schuler back in the day, back when he haul was just going off the air. So I covered <laughs> Heath Schuler back in the day and Heath was a one read and go guy. That's why like guys knew he wasn't going to make it because one read and run. This kid is not typically one read and run, but go ahead. I, you, you threw the heat out there. I mean, and so I would say on, on the other end of that spectrum, and we can get into Drake's pro day too, but yes. Drake was a, was six, six, four. I'll get into and, that in a minute. Six, four and one eights and two twenty seven. I mean, he was, and, and there's a lot of components to this, right. And I'm not saying one guy is better than the other, but like, uh, he came away and you go, that's prototypical size. Right. You, you don't worry about him. And, uh, you know, he, he's a, he's a judicious runner. And so I, I would say you came away with that thinking like, okay, there's no durability concerns with that dude. Right. And, and that's exactly right. And so the one side I do want to get, because this is something we talked about and just for people to know, they, Sam almost, Sam threatened to kick my butt because I dared to question the pressure to sack ratio. Um, and I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. And I think actually, I think we kind of think of like, but it is, it's, as I've told you, like, to me, it's a telling stat. And if I'm a team, I want to know the stat and then go watch the film to see what does it tell me. But that stat is important. And so I don't ever want to just diminish that. But it is one thing, just like the one thing I always tell people with stats. And there was one year where um, the one month I worked for the Washington Post, where I uh, did something on Robert and his first year. And one of the things I noticed was in the second half of the year, he became a much better, much more efficient red zone passer. So I'm like, oh, okay, that's an interesting number. And so I went to Mike Shanahan and said, hey, is he getting better down there? And he said, he said, it wasn't really about that. It was about defense to start playing him one way because of what he could do down there. So his ability to run down there regulated the defense and that made the offense more efficient there. So that's why I say, that's why I say you take the number, you contextualize it, but it is a key stat. And I, I would not diminish that. So let me let me back up for people just to orient them in this conversation. The yes, the pressure you. to yeah the pressure to a sack number is just basically like how often are you sacked when you're pressured, and it's it's one of the metrics that the data community has found is pretty stable for quarterbacks, not just from team to team, but from college to the pros. And it's a number where it's like okay, if this guy is getting pressured, is he trying to extend the plays? Is he trying to play hero ball? Um, or is he getting rid of it? And I think that's something that you saw last year with Sam Howell is, especially early in the year, his pressure to sack numbers were really high because, you know, if he made that first read or he went to his second read and he, and he wasn't decisive, he would hold it and he would get sacked. And so I think that that's why, you know, a lot of people are, 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 are GMs in the data community are looking at, hey, like, what does this tell us about the quarterback? And I want to be very careful because the 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 spirited discussion that Kaim and I had back and forth over text <laughs> was was I almost sent I you thought, to bed without supper. I thought <laughs> you were being dismissive, but you were not. You were probably no. just annoyed that so many people Correct. like use that number as like, oh, uh, he you can't they can't pick Jay Nails his pressure to sack number. That is you gotta right. look at the why. And I think that right. that's where you and I are yes. very much on the same page. Yes. Yes. Because, you know, with Sam Howell in college, it went up every year, but you go, oh, his supporting cast got worse. So he was trying to like ball out, especially when they're behind in games. So it's a thing that, yes, it's stable, but you gotta investigate it further. And so I think that you and I are on the same page of Drake's is lower. Drake's is still a little high, but but Jaden's is high. And, and the year before it was really high in right. last year it was better last year was his best and like that's why like i went through and watched every sack because i'm genuinely curious because with sam you saw him hold the ball 
And we, well, I'm an Ohio State guy. I watched Justin Fields hold the ball. He made, made, made huge plays, and he had all sorts of talent, but he did hold the ball. And so when I would watch, when I would watch Jaden, I didn't think holding the ball was the issue because you'd see him go through the, you could watch him go through the progressions. But what you do see is a guy who knows, like, I know I can make a big play with my legs. And there were times where I didn't feel like LSU had the answer for him. Like guys are not there. There's a pressure that's coming and guys aren't in position to catch the ball. There's not a, and there were a couple of times I felt like, oh, you could have gotten rid of it here or here, but you know, and then sometimes like, okay, one time you squeeze out of this and you get 30 yards the next time you lose three. So it was a few different reasons. It wasn't a theme. And that's what, you know, that's what comforted me about him versus Sam, where I felt like you're holding the ball too much. We talk about scheme. I'm going to switch it to, to Drake May, if that's okay. Yeah, let's go to Drake May, because we don't, we don't have too much time left. One of the things that um, is I thought was interesting from Chapel Hill, and it's something that you could see um, on tape, is, uh, is, is that the throwing session does not matter to a lot of GMs in, in, in the sense of like, you're throwing against air. We've seen you on tape. They know he has a big arm. Right. They know he has a big arm and, and he's throwing the 60 yard bombs. That's fine. Early in his throwing session, Drake may missed a couple outs, you know, the, the, toward the sideline. He airmailed it that, that you wouldn't expect. And I would say that one of the things I noticed is that during, during their um, pro days, Jaden was extremely calm, like extremely loose. He, you know, he had the, he was warming up with a basketball in the same way that CJ Stroud does. He was walking around very chill. And um, and he wasn't like locked in on every teammate, but he was like paying loose attention to them, except when Malik Neighbors, the superstar receiver, um, was running. Like when he ran the 40 yard dash J or, or when he did the bench or when he did whatever, Jaden was locked in. And after the 40 yard dash that neighbors ran, Jaden chased him all the way down um, the field to celebrate with him. And so and Drake, it was a little different. He was like very locked in on every guy, but he was much less energetic. He was, you know, little fist bumps, taps on the back, things like that. So, so I don't know what that means. I'm not saying one is a better leader, but I'm saying it was, it was two different styles right. um, that, that we saw there. And so uh, getting this back to the throwing session, I, I went on a little tangent there. Going back to the throwing session, when Drake mail, Drake may air mails those outs, He's he's definitely showing more visible frustration. He's a little he's a little more on edge. He you know slapped his thigh, things like that. And you know I was talking to some people afterwards, and they were like looking at his feet because one of the big questions about Drake May is his footwork, right? Mm -hmm. And some people, your colleague Dan Orlovsky, says that it's bad enough that he has to sit his rookie year. Others think it's more correctable, but. Those outs, I, I think that some people attributed that to his footwork. And I was talking to the offensive coordinator um, at North Carolina, Chip Lindsay, and he was saying, look, he put some of that on himself. I don't know how much of this is him being a, a good coach trying to cover up for his quarterback or how much is legit, but he was saying, look, when I came in here, I changed his footwork last year, and we went from, you know, they were in shotgun a bunch. We He went from a backpedal to a more traditional three-step drop out of gum. And he said that he Drake could have been a guy who said, I've had a lot of success doing it this way with my feet. I, I want to, you know, I want to keep doing it this way. I, I don't want to change. And he didn't. And I give him a lot of credit for that. Um, and so that's a part of why you saw his footwork not be as crisp last year. And that's why you see some of the accuracy dip on short and intermediate routes. Um, but I thought that that moment early in, early in his throwing session, I don't think that's a devastating thing for his draft stock. But when you start to look deeper into it, you see, okay, there's, there's some threads here that you see on tape. Right. And I think that's where those, those pro days are good for is that you, you mirror it up to what you see. Some of the things that I like just from watching it on TV is just how he wanted to immediately run that same route again. I like that kind of stuff. I, I know. And I think that's like, Hey, let's, I want to get this right. And and I think that's always good. Now how that translates in the game, you don't get that second chance. You throw a bad one. It's a pick. You don't get to say, Hey, wait a minute. You know, um, Bland, Deron Bland, let's go run that back. I wasn't ready for that one. So, but I do like the mindset that is attached to that. And, you know, it's funny because I know some coaches, NFL coaches I've talked to weren't crazy about the change in the offensive systems for May. And they did, you know, most guys that I've talked to would agree with you know people who say he was going to have to sit a little bit. Um, but you know, what's the point, what's, what's the upside. And I think that's what they're going to have to decide. And it's why, I mean, you wrote the story the other day, I'm going to write the same story next week, mayor Daniels, um, with maybe a little JJ sprinkled in, we'll see, but you know, it's just, it's, it makes for an interesting discussion because there's a lot to like about each of these guys. And there's that one thing that gives you pause to say, should you look at the other guy more?
And it's just, it's why it's to me kind of fascinating. It's just the whole, like this to me is like one of the most fun parts of the process, right? Is watching the video, talking to the people, looking at the data, trying to figure out what is the right decision here. And I wake up and change my mind all the yeah. time. And yeah. it, it, it kills me a little bit when I talk to people who are so locked in on one choice. They think one is so clearly better than the other. And like, there are days when I've woken up and been like, oh, yeah. I mean, when still on Bo Nix, right? Yeah. When JJ McCarthy, like there are times that I've been like, okay, like I can see it a little bit, but I think right now I'm just in a phase where I'm like, nah, come on, man. It's, 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 it's mayor Daniels. I like, I really feel like that. Um, and so, and so I think that this is, you know, Adam Peters has a really high stakes decision and I think it's probably defensible either way. Um, but I'm really curious to see how he arrives at his decision. I am too. I think that's the fascinating part. And I will say the beauty of it as sports writers, we can tell you what they should do beforehand definitively and then tell you afterwards when they do the opposite, why they definitively, we can tell you why they made that move. That's the beauty of the jobs that we have, but it's, but I think in this case, it's very true because you can look at, I'm like you, like some days are like, it's absolutely this guy. And then for a while it's been that guy. And then, um, you know, and then, and then it's like, but I can see if they change, I understand because I can see you, we can see what they're looking at with Daniels. There's a game changing ability. He, he throws a nice deep ball. He, you know, he's a, he's electric with, with Drake may, you got the big arm, you got the prototypical size and he can still move. So, you know, there, but, but how long will it take to clean up the mechanical stuff? And, and that's the thing that you have to answer because it's not a given that you clean it up. And, you know, so I think that's what, I think this is one of the more fascinating times. And the good thing is, the fan base has been very rational. <laughs> Not all the and I'm just kidding everybody listening because it's a, it's a very tough issue and people are going to fall in love with the guy and I get it. And it makes, to me, this is what makes it kind of fun to discuss as long as it doesn't go overboard. And I think that like, I will say Adam Peters and Dan Quinn told us at the owners meetings in Orlando, right? Like there's something important about being at pro days or, or just seeing a guy in person. And like, you know, I, I watched the UNC tape and I was like, okay, you know, Drake may has got a strong arm. And then you're there and you're like, shoot, oh, man, like oh, that yeah. 65 yard bomb. That's like hits the dude in stride. It's just, and, and don't get me wrong. Jane Daniels had a couple of really nice throws. He had a, a rollout to the right and he put like a corner route right yeah. on the sideline. And it was just like, it just you just see it and you're like, wow, okay, this is this is different. So I I get why I, I get why like there's so much flip-flopping sometimes. It is. And it's funny because I was watching some more of the Jaden Daniel stuff this morning and yesterday, and he'll make some throws. I'm like, I have to run it back. I'm like, it's just it's a little bit of a religious awakening sometimes with him because like, Jesus, that's just it just but then you watch Drake Mayo do some stuff and like that's a Sunday play. And so like, that's why I say there, there are parts of these games you say for both of them. Um, and I don't, and one, one guy, you know, and sometimes just going to the right spot for you. And that's a big thing in this whole factor as well. And that's going to make a difference. So anyway, Sam, we're running out of time here and again, appreciate it. And I hope you got your mom a nice gift. Time you, you ran that two minute drill extremely well. So uh, let's get out of here. <laughs> All right. My, my pressure to decision-making ratio is improving. So all right. Thanks, Sam. Keep on, baby. That's it for this episode. Thanks to Sam for joining me. And don't forget, check him out on social media at Sam, the number four TR, at Sam for TR. And read his work in the Washington Post at WashingtonPost.com. Thanks for tuning in, as always. And I'll be back with another show on Friday. Talk to you next time.